All right, cool, I'm gonna get started here. So thank you all for coming to uh, this session here today. Appreciate your time. I know there's a lot of other options, a lot of exciting talks this week. And so really happy that you're here to join me for this one. My name is Chris Munns. I'm the business development manager of DevOps services here at AWS. I represent all of our developer and management tools globally. And so today I'm gonna be talking about a couple of those. Uh, I'm gonna uh, take on the demo gods and try to do a live demo of some of, uh, some of these things in motion. So the title of today's talk is Accelerating Software and Delivery with the AWS Developer Tools. And so we'll dive into what those tools are here in a moment. But what I always kind of like to start off with is an initial question of a presentation is why are we here? Right, why are we here in this presentation? What is it about accelerating software delivery that's super important? As Andy in his keynote today was talking about how quickly the world is moving and how quickly you can move on the cloud with all of the services that we have, with all of the tools that exist out there, with the business demands that you have for your own businesses, from your customers to move at an ever-increasing pace. And so what we find is that software moves faster today than it used to. Startups can take on you know, giants with little to no funding. You know, someone in the room can throw a credit card into AWS and start firing up and using incredibly advanced technologies that five, 10 years ago didn't exist and would have been much harder for you to get access to. Uh, getting software into the hands of your customers, so if you're building a software-based application, and whether it be something that gets installed on a mobile device or something that ends up in a web browser, it's really, really easy today, right? Mobile ecosystem is incredibly available for folks. Your application is just a download away from millions of users. And then lastly, there's this aspect of disruption. So we see disruption today with small companies taking on large traditional organizations that have been around for dozens of years in ways that these companies never thought was possible. Uh, an example of this in the, the fintech space today, you have these very small startups taking on financial giants that never thought that they were gonna have to run into the, some of the potential concerns that they see today from these much more nimble companies. Again, a big part of it is because of the delivery model. Once upon a time, you would have had to get into your car, drive to a store like seen uh, in the example here, search around on some shelves for a box of software, go to the checkout, bring it home, pop that into your CD drive, floppy disk drive, whatever it might be, and take it from there. Today what we have is all of the devices that I show here on uh, what is your right-hand side are part of an app-driven ecosystem, right? But the Tesla is an example, great one here. About a year or so ago, drivers woke up and all of a sudden their cars could drive themselves. Right? That's an incredible change in terms of getting software out into the hands of consumers in a way that really wasn't possible a number of years back. So what do you need to enable this model? So there's a number of different tools that you need in order to support this ability for you to move really fast and for you to accelerate your delivery. Tools to manage the flow of your software development. Tools to properly test, inspect, and you know, confirm that your code is working the way that at least you expect it to be and that it should be and is performing well for your users. And then lastly, tools to deploy your application. Again, depending on what your application might be, this could greatly vary. So a number of things here, right, in order to allow us to move more quickly. But I think first what we should do is talk a little bit about the software release process. I spend a lot of time talking to companies all over the world about software release process. And there's a number of terminologies that we all have and that we use sometimes interchangeably. And so what I want to kind of quickly do is just set how we at AWS represent some of these terms. So we see four major phases that exist inside of software delivery. Some of these get repeated, but essentially you could think of it as these, these four different topics. So pretty straightforward, the first one, your source, right? The ability, the idea that you have written code, you're storing that code, someone has potentially reviewed that code. The code then is going to go through a build phase. That build could require code compilation, unit tests, style checkers, code metrics, creating container images, creating mobile app images, all sorts of different things you might wanna do there. Test would be taking that application then past that build phase, right? So you might have already done some testing, again, via code inspection, but taking that deliverable asset that you have and further testing it. So maybe in the case of a mobile application, it's throwing into something like Device Farm. In the case of a web-based application, it's putting into a web environment for further testing and, and so forth. And then lastly, this concept of production. So actually getting your application, your software that you're delivering out to your users so that they can consume it, so that hopefully you can find success in the delivery of that application. So these are the four major phases. What come along with this are three different types of uh, essentially what we see as process levels that exist across these four phases. 
So the first is continuous integration, this idea that we are writing code, we are committing it frequently. That code then is being tested and built uh, very, very rapidly. Uh, there used to be organizations that would do integration testing nightly, weekly, monthly. Today we see organizations doing this in the minutes of ranges. Continuous delivery then, often referred to as the CD and CI and CD, is taking this application deliverable that you've built and again pushing it out over a pipeline. And typically what there is is some sort of a gate that exists between testing, you know, staging development and production. So whether that gate is a manual action, whether that gate is some sort of a, a logical or test driven gate, there's something that is keeping that application from going automatically out to your end consumers. And then lastly, continuous deployment, which is kind of the, the goal that a lot of people want to get to, is the idea that you have this entire thing automated. So from check-in all the way out to consumption by your customers, this entire thing has been automated. So again, we've got kind of four phases, three different types of, of process levels of how we deliver software. So again, just kind of wanted to set that base point. In terms of talking about what we do at Amazon, we have a very unique and what we like to say peculiar organizational structure at Amazon. Uh, something that's been in place now for going on almost 15 years, and it's this concept that we have of building microservices as supported by two pizza teams. Now, we could go and talk about just this topic right here for many hours in a given day. But essentially what it comes down to, this concept of two pizza teams, is the idea that a team typically made up of six to 10 people owns a complete product or a part of a complete product. Everything from the development to the operationalization to the testing to the support, whether that support be internal to Amazon's other businesses or other teams, or whether they're supporting AWS's public support team that you as customers of AWS have access to. What they're building are these very, very small services that are part of a greater whole. So if we take services like EC2, that's made up of dozens of microservices. And so two pizza teams will own some number of microservices that will build up a greater whole. And essentially we have throughout Amazon is this idea of two pizza teams supporting two pizza teams, consuming the software from other two pizza teams, and it's kind of this big giant mesh of two pizza team structure. And so that kind of lends itself into a little bit more of what I'm gonna talk about here. And so given the structure, what we have is the ability to move really, really fast at Amazon. So this number at the bottom here is from 2014, but we have thousands of these two pizza teams that are building these microservices that are practicing continuous delivery. Many of them are doing continuous deployment, but some don't have that full automation across many different environments. So staging, beta, production, one region, another region. And so what it meant is in 2014, we did 50 million deploys that year through our primary deploy tool. That's where the stack comes from, and I'll talk about that tool in a moment. So that's about a deploy per second. Uh, so that's a lot of deploying happen very, very, very frequently, again, based on the structure that we have. So a little bit more about this, right? How does it work? We talk about DevOps kind of being made up of three different things, uh, cultural philosophy, practices, and tools. From a, a culture perspective here, in terms of talking a little bit more about two pizza teams, each team, again, owns their product. So they create the product, typically, again, a software product. They handle all of the, the QA of that product, so they are their own QA team. They respond to issues like on call, so that development team, that part of that two pizza team is part of a normal pager rotation. And then lastly, they support the business of this product. So they track its goals, they track metrics, and um, for both business and technical aspects. From the practices side, something we often get asked from folks is, how do you do Agile, how do you do Scrum? I actually couldn't give you a direct answer on that. Across the thousands of teams that we have, they practice different sprint cycles, they practice different methodologies. Some of them might have daily stand-ups, some of them might have weekly stand-ups, some of them may have no stand-ups. We give these teams the flexibility to decide what pattern and process they want to use for how they deliver their, their applications and their software. The other is that there's no centralized change management. So all of these teams are driving in parallel their software as they're building it uh, without the need to go to a centralized you know, group team or a process. So you can think of the fact that we have thousands of these two pizza teams, if we were to have some sort of centralized gatekeeping governance organization uh, that needed thousands of meetings to support us launching as quickly as we can, uh, we would need probably thousands of centralized governance people to make that happen. And then lastly, one of the things that I like to say is that developers on Amazon are basically given a, a somewhat fixed box of tools. And I'll talk a little bit about this, but we've basically built up tools that our developers use so that they can be really effective at their work. It's very difficult for an organization in a large scale to move very fast if developers have to own 
all of the components and all of the tools that would you know, make up what they need in order to ship their product. And so basically what we say is we put a very, very easy to understand carrot on a stick. Use the tools that we're providing or you have to operationalize your own and meet certain standards that, that we set based on how we want to have these tools run. And so the more time that you spend on operationalizing these tools, the less time you spend on development, the less time you spend on development, the more likely you are to miss your roadmap goals, the more likely you are to miss your uh, you know, technical and business metrics. So it's very easy in order to drive kind of that idea that you should be using the tools that we provide such that they have the best benefits for you producing your product. And a lot of these tools have very kind of interesting guardrails built into them around best practices and patterns and things like that to keep these developers from not having to imagine these things or research these things or come up with them every time. And then these tools are then maintained by other two pizza teams. So the tools that we have here at AWS that represent the service teams for the services that you consume are using tools that are built by other teams and then those teams operate the same way as the teams that are building uh, consumable services that you would use from AWS. So it gives us this really interesting kind of view into what the responsibility is for a given team. So I like to kind of joke about this Venn diagram that has a very, very, very small little overlap. Basically what it is is that we want our developers focusing on what is in the green, which is just their product. We don't want them thinking anything about what's in the blue. We don't want them having to go and find a CI CD tool, a deployment tool, a monitoring tool, a metrics tool, a logging tool. We're going to provide all of those things for them such that they can come in and iterate very, very, very quickly. When Andy this morning talked about our release velocity at AWS and how it's increased over the years, a big part of what enables and drives that is the fact that developers aren't spending time on what's in the blue circle, again, unless their product is one of those things in the blue circle. So again, one of the things that enables us to move very, very quickly. So going back to software delivery, how is it that we are able to, again, get to where we are today? And so a big part of it is that many years ago, we started building our own tools in the space. Now, largely we had to build our own tools because we had our own kind of interesting requirements and infrastructure needs and application needs, and we're doing these things before a lot of the tools that you can now consume even existed. So I'll talk about two of these tools real quick. The first one is a tool called Apollo. Apollo is a deployment tool used inside of Amazon by almost every Amazon developer that deploys code onto either a physical or a virtual server. It has a number of great capabilities built into it, uh, zero downtime deployments, health checking, version artifacts, and rollbacks. And so it becomes very easy for developers to get code again out into environments. Another tool that we built is a tool called Pipelines. And so Pipelines is our continuous delivery tool internally, plugs directly into Apollo, and it gives developers the ability to automate that from check-in to production deployment, potentially with gates, but definitely with testing, with build phases, and again, with many different environmental deploys, as totally part of that process. And so what we found when we built this tool is that development and deployment was much faster, much safer, because we were automating it and moving some of the human element. It was consistent and standardized, and then we made it a visual process. And so the consistent and standardized aspect was nice because as developers maybe moved from one project to another project, from team to team, or you know, whole business unit to a different business unit inside the company, all they needed to do was look at a services pipeline, and they could immediately gain a ton of knowledge about that. So another thing that we do inside of Amazon is Every single year, we look to gain information from the technical community inside of the company on what's working for them, what things they like, what things they don't like, what things they want to see us improve. And so we found in our 2014 survey, we had kind of some unique questions that year. But one of the outcomes was from it is that we found that we could prove statistically that developers were happier who were using our pipelines tool and who were using it in the fashion of having more automation, so moving closer to continuous deployment. And what we were, again, able to derive from this is that continuous delivery makes developers happy because you're able to be much more productive. You can have a higher quality assurance of your application. You remove some of the delays that come traditionally with handoff. And so what we've actually now done is basically made it almost mandatory for teams to use pipelines. And we continue to measure and track how many of them are moving towards continuous deployment, uh, which is not something that I've seen other organizations do today. So, a little bit, again, about the software delivery process, a little bit about how we do things at Amazon. What we'll talk about next is what has come from that into AWS services that you can consume today. So today, as part of the services that we have here at AWS, there are three uh, developer tools that are part of what we call our CodeStar services. Uh, we use CodeStar as in code asterisks here. 
So AWS Code Pipeline, AWS Code Deploy, and AWS Code Commit. We're focusing on the first two today primarily because they come again directly out of things that we've learned internally here at Amazon. So AWS Code Pipeline is the AWSification, if you will, of the internal pipelines tool. Code Deploy is us taking Apollo and rebuilding it as an AWS service. And then Code Commit's actually something that we, we built from the ground up in response to customer feedback for customers looking for uh, you know, ways to store Git in the cloud that was encrypted and secure and had lots of different uh, security capabilities, as well as a very high level of redundancy and durability. And so it's a hosted Git service that lives on top of S3 and Dynamo and our key management service. So when we take these three services and we map them out here against our release steps, uh, what we have here is code commit in the commit or source stage. For the build and test stage today, we don't have uh, any services, but what we do have is a very rich third-party ecosystem of both SaaS offerings, enterprise offerings, open source offerings that we have integrated with the rest of our tool suite. And then lastly, code deploy, which can be used for production deployments. And as many of you know, we actually have a number of different uh, deploy tools at Amazon, but just in terms of talking about what exists in the code services. And so code deploy allows you to deploy both on EC2 and uh, off of EC2, so basically anywhere else that you can run the agent. And we'll talk about code deploy here a little later. Code pipeline then can be used to orchestrate this entire process. So again, from commit all the way out to production deploy, that's basically what code pipeline exists to give you. And what it does is plug in then to all of these tools. Let's so dive maybe a little bit deeper into code pipeline. So a code pipeline, again, is our continuous delivery service. It allows you to model and visualize your deployment flow for basically any application that you could think of, whether it's a web app, an API service, a batch processing service, a mobile application, basically anything that you could build that is software can be modeled inside of code pipeline. It allows you, to, again, to model out things like builds, tests, deploys, a number of other actions. And then it integrates, again, with third-party tools and other AWS services. Let's walk through a little bit of what a pipeline looks like. So this is a little bit of a representation, but I'll show you the console here in a bit. So this is a pipeline. A pipeline is made up of stages. Stages are made up of actions. Actions or stages are then connected via transitions. We also give you the ability to do things such as parallel actions inside of a stage. Um, so these will happen directly at the same time. And we also give you the ability to have sequential actions inside of a stage. And you can have many, many stages and many, many actions and a lot of parallelization and sequential actions here. So again, depending on what your application is, you can model pretty much anything you could think of of application uh, lifecycle management. Oops. One of the other things that we launched uh, back in the summer is the ability for you to have manual approvals. So again, going back to that gate that might exist in continuous delivery but not in continuous deployment, uh, with this, you can actually message out via SNS to an email address, to uh, a Lambda function, to uh, an S, uh, a text message, pretty much anything that you can plug into SNS today or simple notification service. So I'll walk you through here a little bit about how Code Pipeline works. So I'm a developer. I've now committed some code to GitHub.com. I have my pipeline up and running and already configured. And so it is going to be pulling GitHub looking for changes. So in this case, it notices that I've just committed some new code. It's going to grab those changes, put them into an S3 bucket as a source artifact, and then transition on to the next stage. In this stage, what I have is a build action that's uh, supported by Jenkins. So for Jenkins, we have an open source plugin that you can download and integrate it into Jenkins. And so that plugin is going to be pulling for a job. It's going to acknowledge that job take on that job and start acting on it. So in this case, it's going to grab my source code. I have a Java application. And so it's going to you know, build and test or whatever it is that I want to do inside of Jenkins. In this case, then I'm going to put my built artifact back into S3 and then put back a success back to the pipeline. From here now, we transition on to my deploy stage, which is going to make use of Elastic Beanstalk. And so in this case, what happens is code pipeline grabs that uh, deployable built artifact passes it off to Elastic Beanstalk, and Elastic Beanstalk does what it needs to do. So in this case, as a developer, all that I've done is written in commit code. Behind the scenes, Code Pipeline has interfaced with four different services, uh, two of them AWSs, two of them third parties. So again, you see here kind of the example of how we could accelerate 
from the developer's perspective, getting code out there, tested, and deployed out to different environments. So we have a number of different service integrations on our side here at AWS. For source, we support S3, we support code commit. We give you the ability to invoke Lambda functions. So what's really great about this is because you can invoke Lambda, you can call pretty much anything that you can think of from a Lambda function, including things like EC2 run command, which would allow you to execute commands on EC2 instances. So anything you can run inside of a Lambda function by calling another API service or anything you want to do in that Lambda function, or anything that you could run on compute somewhere using EC2 run command. So basically, kind of unlimited possibilities of what you could integrate yourself with code pipeline. And then on the deploy side, we have a number of different services that we support. So again, code deploy, uh, CloudFormation, which we recently just launched a couple weeks ago, Beanstalk, and OpsWorks. And now the CloudFormation one is actually particularly interesting because you typically don't think about your infrastructure code the same way that you do your application code. But there is kind of this big motion behind treating your infrastructure as code via CI, CD processes. And I'll show you that here in my demo in a little bit. In terms of third parties, we have a, a strong list that's continuing to grow. Uh, Team City recently came out of beta for their integration with Code Pipeline. Uh, if you are working for an organization that produces software that is part of SDLC, your application lifecycle management, we would love to talk to you about getting you integrated with Code Pipeline. And so uh, you can come out to the booths and the developer lounges at the Expo Center, or you can come and track me down for that. And so what do we see customers doing in extending code pipeline? So we see them doing things such as integrating mobile application testing, updating ticketing systems. Maybe you want to put something into JIRA around delivery of your application. Uh, provisioning resources, again, with cloud formation or other tools. Updating dashboards. So putting a message into uh, something like a data dog, potentially. Uh, sending notifications, Slack, email, HipChat, what have you. Uh, and doing things like security scans. So using various third parties to scan your infrastructure, to scan your code, whatever you might want to do there. So talking a little bit about kind of that build phase, so we talked about the overall kind of continuous delivery process. What does it mean to actually build code these days? So building code typically refers to languages that are compiled. So something where you have raw code, you're turning into a binary, um, number of different languages that support this, as well as mobile applications. Um, and then also now today in the container space, creating a container image. However, there are many languages that don't require building, such as PHP, Ruby, Python. And so in this case, we're, we're not necessarily coming out with some sort of an artifact. Although what we might be doing is creating a package to go into a true artifact tracing system like an artifactory or a nexus or something similar. But testing your code is an incredibly important thing. And so when it comes to testing your code, you know, desired functionality, looking for bugs, standardizing on code patterns and syntax, things like that, uh, testing your application for security purposes. And this is one of the kind of key things about continuous integration and delivery that I find many organizations don't spend enough time focusing on the degree to which they're testing their application as part of this process. It's very difficult to move towards continuous delivery and continuous deployment without spending the appropriate amount of time on testing your applications and having the right tools in place to enable this. When it comes to deploying your application, again, there's a number of different options. In talking about code deploy, uh, dive into a little bit here. So code deploy, again, allows you to have zero downtime deployments based off the internal tool we have at Amazon called Apollo. It gives you the ability now today to do automatic rollbacks. So that's a feature that we launched just a couple of weeks ago. You can deploy on EC2 or off EC2. It's completely OS and language agnostic. Um, I actually have a coworker who is running it on a Raspberry Pi in his apartment that he uses as a media PC, if you will. And this also integrates with a number of third-party tools. So actually, most of the major CI and CD third-party tools out there, we have a plugin for code, pipe, for, uh, code deploy. Uh, so tools like GitHub and Travis CI and Circle CI and Solana Labs and things like that. So code deploy is an agent-based service. So you install an agent on your host. And one of the key things about that agent when it acts on a deployment is that it's going to look for an instruction file that exists in the root of your deployable artifact. So your deployable artifact is typically a zip file. You'll package your uh, application into that zip file. So even if you're deploying, say, a jar or an MSI or just raw code, it's going to go into a zip file. And inside of that is going to be this app spec file. 
And so I won't expect you to be able to read into everything that's in this, this brief example here. What there is to take away from this is that there's a number of different capabilities that come inside of this instruction file that make code deploy really, really dynamic. So the first is the pairing of, for the files uh, section here, of source and destination. So we see an example of just one, but you can actually have multiple source and destination pairings such that you could bundle, for example, application configuration into the same artifact as the application code, send the configuration to one place, send the application code to another. So potentially reducing some of the work done by, say, a configuration management tool. For permissions, you can actually get pretty fine-grained in terms of setting permissions that would exist again on files. Now, this is pretty straightforward, but this is one of those things that often you know, developers may not have the right permissions set for files as they go into, say, something like you know, Git or wherever they're storing their source code. And so this gives you the ability to apply that on top of that. But then the most interesting part of this at the bottom here are these lifecycle hooks. So what we give you are a number of preset scheduled events that are part of a deployment during which you can run any sort of script that you can think of. Uh, depending on your OS, it could be a PowerShell script, a shell script, a Python command. And essentially, it's inside of these scripts that you can do again, pretty much anything on the host. So for examples for this, what we see people doing is doing things such as removing an instance from getting traffic behind a load balancer, installing dependencies, restarting services, testing and validating that the application was deployed successfully, and then re-adding it to a load balancer. So why is this important? Why is this a powerful capability? Because one of the things that we also give you with code deploy again is this ability to support zero downtime deployments. And one of the ways that we do this is by giving you the ability to choose a speed at which your application is deployed across the fleet. So we see a couple of examples here of one at a time, half at a time, all at once. You can technically do any integer or percentage-based value that you want of a given fleet of hosts. And so in the example of where we have a given pool, let's say it's a web application, it's taking traffic behind a load balancer, we could pull hosts off of the load balancer, do our deployment, whatever changes we need to do, and add them back onto the load balancer, and then continue through. If at any point in time one of these hosts fail, the deployment will stop, or we can have the deployment automatically rolled back to the previous known working version on this. So it makes deployments really, really safe, uh, which is a very key aspect of doing continuous delivery. We give you the ability to have a number of different ways of targeting hosts. One is with auto-scaling groups, the other is based on tags. One of the cool aspects about auto-scaling groups is that as new hosts come up, and the code deploy agent starts on those hosts, so we're assuming either that you're passing it in via user data or baked into an AMI. What it will go and do is say, okay, I'm part of this auto-scaling group. What is the last successful deploy that happened to this auto-scale group? Give it to me as a new instance. So this allows you to not have to worry about more complicated bootstrapping of your application code on your host, having to bake an AMI that has that code on there. And so it really helps enable auto-scaling to work really, really well. Cool, so let's actually go and look at a pipeline here. And again, I'm gonna attempt the demo gods. Bear with me if, if things go boom. Cool, so a little bit about this demo. I'll pull up a link here in a little bit. Earlier this year, back in April, we released what we call a starter kit for the CodeStar services. So what it does is we have a CloudFormation template that you can basically one-click launch, and it will create for you a full VPC environment, a pipeline, a Jenkins instance, and what we call a, uh, I believe, a beta and a production EC2 instance, one of each, with code deploy set upon it, and we have a pre-built application. So you can actually go today and you could use this and, and create it. What I've done here is I've actually modified this slightly, and I now have two pipelines that I'm gonna show you. Now, what's interesting about both of these pipelines is that both of them are built and maintained by CloudFormation. The other interesting thing is that one of these pipelines uses CloudFormation to launch the other one. So the first one that I have here, which is called CodeStar Pipeline, is uh, what I use to launch the application environment and infrastructure. All that this is doing is tracking that other CloudFormation template that is part of our starter kit. So what I have here is my source, which comes from code commit, and I can actually deep link directly into the commits and into the repo that I used for these changes. Down below here, what I have is a stage that is for my app infrastructure automation. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually making use of CloudFormation again to launch these resources. And with CloudFormation, uh, 
about midpoint of this year, maybe a little before that, we launched a capability called Change Sets. What Change Sets allow you to do is basically view what will change about a CloudFormation template or about an environment when you update its template. So what I can do here in Code Pipeline is as you see here, I'm waiting for a manual action, a review. I could come in and view what it is that's going to be changed about my infrastructure environment. I see what I have actually done here is I'm modifying a security group. And so stepping back a little bit, what I have for this environment is a configuration file, essentially a parameter file that CloudFormation is going to use. The your IP address parameter that I'm passing into that template uh, I was in another room earlier today, and I had one IP address. I came in here, and I had a different IP address. And so I've updated this parameter file, committed it to my code commit repository, and that's what brings us to what we see here in this pipeline. So from here, I can now review this change. So I've gone and I've looked at the change set. I can comment and approve. What will happen then is CloudFormation will take this actual change set and apply it to my running environment. I'll go and show you the other stack that I have, which is my actual application stack. So the aspect that I'm changing is the security group for my Jenkins instance, which is, is running as part of this environment. So this is my actual application pipeline. So the first one is my infrastructure pipeline. The second one here is my application pipeline. What I have, again, is my application source stored in code commit. I can go and look at the most recent commit from that. I then have my Jenkins instance, which I've used to build this code. And so this application is a Java-based application that we have as part of the starter kit as a demo. What I then have down here in what I call my beta phase is I have an application deployment that I've done to an environment. I could pull up this right here. And what I'm doing now is I'm going to review this application. Now, in a more perfect world, hopefully I'd have some automated tests that I'm going to do. But for many organizations, they're not there yet. There still needs to be some level of manual confirmation that an application looks and performs the way that it should. So what I'll do here is I'll go into code deploy. And again, I launched this window from the pipeline. What I can see here is that there was a deploy that happened down to an instance ID. And I can see lots of things about this deploy. I can see the application name, the deployment group that was used. I can see the revision location, so where was this application coming from. I can see the deployment config that I used for this. So uh, I, I was going with a one at a time, even though I just have a, a single host here. I can actually go and view the events of this deploy. So again, I mentioned that there's a number of lifecycle events that I can run scripts during. And so what I see here is that all of these have passed. If one of them had failed, the agent would have captured those fail logs and made it avail available for me here in the console to diagnose what it is that went wrong about my deployment. But what I'm actually going to do is go and confirm that my application looks good. So I'm actually just going to go and pull up the IP address from the EC2 console. And I could have a DNS name and, and make this a little bit cleaner. Um, but this is kind of how the demo builds it up. Awesome. So this is our really exciting demo application. We call it Bespoke Suits for Dogs. Uh, we talk about the bespoke suits that we could be selling for our dogs. So I'm going to go ahead and confirm this looks good. Fido looks great in his little bandana and his little hat. So what I'm now going to do is come back into my uh, code pipeline and again improve this. So this is going to finish this stage and then transition on to the next and execute code deploy. If I go back here to CloudFormation, what I have in my environment are these two application stacks. So previously, if we go and look here, under events, we can see what I just updated before. Oops, actually, it's in here, yeah. I can go and see here before where I updated the EC2 security group for my uh, Jenkins instance. And so I could actually go back into my pipeline and now be able to view the build details of my application. My IP address might have changed already. <laughs> okay. The demo gods got me on that one. Um, but anyway, so the security group change would have applied to the IP address if I had the same IP address that I put in there from earlier before. Um, but anyway, so what you've seen is 
CloudFormation managing code pipeline, code pipeline managing CloudFormation, code pipeline managing application changes, the ability for me to put manual actions into my pipelines, and pipelines being used again here to model out two different things, infrastructure and application change. Again, I could integrate inside of this and add more actions and more steps. So via the interface here, I can come in and add uh, you know, actions that would be sequentially or parallel to what exists across the number of different action categories that we have. So for example, I can go back to you know, a uh, test phase. We actually have a number of different test providers that are integrated directly here into the console. Um, they will go and do things like single sign-on and other good stuff like that. Or I can go back to my CloudFormation template and I can go down and create for my pipeline the configuration that I want to use. So again, I can use infrastructure as code to manage my pipeline, to manage my infrastructure as code, to manage my pipeline, to manage my application. So it's a little bit of inception in terms of what's capable here. But what's great is as a developer, I'm not going and clicking in the console randomly and configuring things. I have full tracking, full traceability for what my changes are. And I can very easily share these templates and these configurations with other people on my team, and they can recreate that. So again, you can actually go and find the starter kit that we have from a blog post from earlier this year. Again, that's going to give you this one button click cloud formation template that will set up code pipeline, code deploy, Jenkins, uh, infrastructure environment, and so forth. Um, I'll let folks take a picture of that. But the slides will be posted later. So what I want to kind of touch up on here and, and, and finalize are some of the best practices that our developers have found that we find are really valuable when you're thinking about accelerating software delivery. So again, CI and CD is a must. There is basically no way for an Amazon developer to take code that they've written on their you know, personal machine and get it into a production environment without it going through a pipeline, without it having first gone through a code repository, without it going through some level of test steps. You want to make sure that you're building on every commit, and you want to make sure that you are committing frequently. So the idea of nightly builds, weekly builds, or some sort of other period that aren't every commit is something that does not allow you to think about moving very quickly as part of this process. And then again, you want to deploy to some sort of an environment for further testing. Uh, everything that is code, or everything is code really, so our application, our infrastructure, things like documentation goes into a repository. What this allows us to do then is take all those things that we treat as code and apply CI and CD to them. So you saw me treat my infrastructure as code, my application was obviously code, and if there were other aspects of this demo, I could have treated them the same way as well. Basically, if it's not in a repository and it's not going through some sort of a pipeline, it doesn't go into production. And I think this is a good habit and a good standard to set internally for most organizations. You want to start with continuous delivery, right? Again, this aspect of a gated process that exists. For many organizations, getting directly through continuous deployment would require a whole lot of testing, a whole lot of excellence into the testing that you're doing. And again, very often there is that need for human intervention or human review. So start with the mindset of we're going to have some sort of approval step exist. And actually, in Code Pipeline, you have the ability to permission out uh, the approval to a different team than a team that's maybe writing the code. So you can have it such that only a QA team or a security team can approve things. Uh, whereas the developers have the ability to commit code and maybe modify a pipeline. And then lastly, we follow practices such as deploying to canaries or kind of standalone instances that get tested that are part of production infrastructure. Then we will deploy to a single AZ in a given region, test again. Then we will sometimes deploy to an entire region, test again. And this is part of how we do rollout across the globe for our services. A canary in each region, AZ by AZ, region by region. Some other best practices here. So code reviews we find are one of the best mechanisms for good code, all right? What does good code mean? Code that looks clean, code that's maintainable, code that functions the way, not only that it should, but that is maybe also the best desired way to make code function. So we very often have code reviews be a key part of our process, getting someone else on the team to, to again, review a change or look at something before it goes live, and this is another good place for you know, manual actions. Style checkers. Uh, this is another one that I find a lot of companies don't, don't follow. 
but establishing internally in your organization a style for how you're going to accept people writing code. Uh, this, may, again, plays into code maintainability, to understanding of uh, code as it gets reviewed by one person on one team or another person on another team. In terms of deployment, auto rollbacks are really, really key. Uh, at, at Amazon, what we find is that there's very few failures that impact an end customer. Why? Because we, again, do these, these staged phased rollouts. And as soon as we see an issue with the deployment, we immediately revert it. So instead of leaving it out there to diagnose in production and figure out what might have gone wrong, we want to immediately get back to a previously running stable, acceptable state, and then rely on things like logs and metrics and other monitoring tools in order to tell us what is that went wrong, right? What did we miss in dev or in staging that made its way further out? And then lastly, very thorough dashboards. So engineers at Amazon and AWS are expected to maintain dashboards of all of their key metrics, all of the things that are both maybe you consider them business impacting and technology impacting. Today with CloudWatch, you can build your own dashboards of the metrics that are important to you. And what this allows you to do again is after you've rolled back, going to those dashboards and saying, okay, what just changed? What was it that changed in terms of metrics or in terms of maybe the logs that we're seeing? What does normal look like? So now we can have very long retention periods in CloudWatch logs so we can see, all right, this is how it looked yesterday, this is how it looked last week, this is how it looked a month ago. And then figuring out from there, um, you know, based on if this graph looks good or not, how was that impacted, what was the alarm that was maybe triggered, and then can I correlate an action with a move in a graph? And so part of how this can be done is that today for services like Code Deploy, we actually are capturing events into things like CloudWatch events as well as CloudTrail. So you could go and view, okay, this deploy just happened, it correlates with this graph, here's how I can troubleshoot that. So some other tricks and tips just here for the CodeStar services. Again, what we saw is that my pipeline and my code deploy configuration and everything about my demo was managed by CloudFormation. CloudFormation is really great for in treating your infrastructure as code in kind of a self-documenting way that you can track, that you can share, and, and easily update and modify. So again, think of all of these resources that can be you know, provisioned and built out that way. Uh, all of the CodeStar services have very deep integration with IAM. So what that means is that I can have one group of people inside of my organization responsible maybe for establishing what a pipeline looks like, so setting standards for that. I can have another team that has access to commit to code repositories that are plugged into those pipelines. I can have another group of uh, IAM users that are responsible for approving manual approval steps. And then I can have other credentials that are set up for as part of the automation for code deploy. And so I can very easily segregate out responsibilities and roles inside of my business across this delivery pipeline to the appropriate people. And then lastly, all three of these services have a way to integrate with Lambda. So if you haven't gotten really excited about Lambda yet, if you're new to AWS, maybe don't know a whole lot about it, really encourage you to spend time reading about Lambda. Uh, we pretty much all believe that this is very much the future of compute, and there's a lot of capabilities that you have here. So CodeCommit has what we call repository triggers, so on a commit, the ability to trigger a Lambda function. A code deploy has event notifications. These can go out over SNS and also tr trigger a Lambda function. And then code pipeline, again, has a native invocation capability for calling Lambda. So again, with this, you could call pretty much anything you could write inside of a Lambda function, or again, call things such as run command. So kind of summarizing here, we've had kind of a quick review into the CodeStar services, looked at code pipeline, looked at code deploy, talk briefly about code commit. You wanna think about, again, automating your pipelines. Try to establish that guideline of code must be stored in a repository, a repository must be connected to some sort of a CI CD tool, and that CI CD tool becomes the only accessible way into a deploy tool, which is the only way to get code into some sort of infrastructure, again, production, ideally. Uh, again, store everything as code. So when we saw the entire environment, entire demo is stored as code, is tracked as code, can be modified as code. And lastly, so this is uh, Dev 201, kind of an intro to a number of things that we have here at AWS and at the reInvent Summit. There's a bunch of other great DevOps talks this week, a number of them that go really deep into some of these services. Uh, in particular, uh, Dev 310 is gonna talk in a lot of depth about how you can use code deploy for application deployments and all sorts of interesting patterns there. Uh, Dev 403, uh, which is a talk by the software development manager for Code Pipeline is going to go really, really deep into continuous delivery techniques. And then there are a number of others that exist here around serverless and things like that. 
Uh, back earlier this year, we announced our DevOps landing page, so aws amazon.com slash DevOps. Off of this, you could find resources for all of the webinars that we do, all of the summit talks that we do, all of our reInvent talks will be posted off of there as well. You can also find our DevOps blog, uh, which we are pushing out content to in very rapid form. We have kind of all of the people inside of AWS uh, that are interested in DevOps, writing blog posts, writing interesting tidbits. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and coming to this session. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more about some of the CodeStar services, about how we think about CI and CD, and how you can start to work on accelerating your software delivery. Thank you very much.